um, uh, I think this early, this half talk of early career uh, scientists is very nice. And so if you know of a very promising early career scientist, or if you are one, uh, please send us the na your name a suggestion to either me, Dana Delot, or Tracy Vogler, and uh, we'll try to schedule them in the future. All right, uh, so our uh, second speaker is Dr. Sylvia Pandolfi, and um, she uh, is, was a graduate student in France at, at the Sorbonne, where uh, her work was on uh, high pressure materials, and uh, she did some very beautiful work on creating six coordinate silicon. And now she's at uh, SLAC uh, National Laboratory, where uh, she is working on advanced X-ray imaging uh, techniques for shock materials. So Sylvia, please go right ahead. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Can you see the screen and the pointer and hear me well? Yes, I see your slide, I see your pointer. Great. And, um, obviously I hear you or else I wouldn't have been able to say it. <laughs> Perfect, okay, glad everything is working. Uh, not always the case. There's no video of you, but I think that's a feature of the way this is set up. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, um, so, well, uh, thank you everyone for your patience this morning. I'm really happy to be able to present to you today uh, our latest result on uh, the deformation mechanism of shock compressed silicon. I wanted to thank the organizers for having me today and Professor Danadlot for the nice introduction. And since we're already like running late on schedule, I'll just dive right in. Uh, just a quick um, introduction to stress once again, why we should be interested in studying silicon under extreme condition. Well, silicon is a very ubiquitous material. So its behavior at extreme condition is interesting for uh, different uh, fields of science ranging from planetary science, uh, but also for the synthesis of potentially new uh, advanced um, uh, material for applications. And another interesting thing about silicon is that it has a very rich phase diagram. Like here, for example, we can see how it transformed from the semiconducting diamond-like silicon one to the metallic tetragonal silicon two, then an orthorhombic uh, EMA 11 phase and an hexagonal silicon five phase over the span of only 20, 50 to 20 gigapascal. So it's actually very widely used also as a computational benchmark um, for new um, uh, computational and predictive method because of this like very rich phase diagram. And of course, another very interesting thing about silicon is that because we've used silicon so extensively in industry, right now it's a material for which we can have um, very easily samples with negligible uh, defect concentration. So it's actually a very good uh, starting point if we want to gain new insight and try to uh, obtain uh, and acquire a deep understanding of the deformation mechanism at the string condition at an atomic level, because we know that we can have samples for which the effects of the a defect in the starting material are actually negligible. So despite being such a well-known and relatively simple uh, material with this uh, FCC structure, silicon when under extreme condition, in particular under shock compression, exhibit a pretty complex behavior. So here I'm just showing a schematic of a conventional um, picture of like deformation um, mechanism that can, different deformations that can happen in a material when subject to a shock wave. So we can have a, at first an elastic uniaxial uh, deformation that is uh, thought classically to be followed by a plastic deformation, by which we mean a generation and uh, motion of defects. And then if the stress is high enough, uh, the sample can actually, uh, undergo a phase transition for which its uh, bulk crystalline structure uh, changes to uh, assume like a lower energy uh, configuration. 
And in early studies on silicon using uh, visor uh, velocimetry, um, it was uh, thought uh, to, well, these studies uh, have identified the onset of different compression waves in silicon under shock compression, which were thought to correspond exactly to the onset of this like three distinct uh, deformation regime. However, uh, there have been some uh, theoretical calculation that have suggested that uh, deformation in silicon could happen in a radically different way, uh, which was uh, named inelastic deformation. And what we mean by that is that when the um, elastic wave transfers the sample, this means that there is an imbalance and so a sheer uh, stress because of uh, the uniaxial nature of the compression for which like the, the pressure um, along uh, the direction of the um, shockwave propagation is much higher than the one uh, perpendicularly to the shockwave propagation. And whilst not, uh, classically, the relaxation towards a more hydrostatic uh, state in which the pressure is like uh, equal in all direction. And so the difference between these two uh, uh, the pressure along these two directions goes to zero. Well, this is classically thought to happen with the generation of defect. What uh, MD simulation suggested is that in silicon, it might be the phase transition itself to be uh, the shear release uh, mechanism. So it could happen that silicon could undergo an elastic uh, deformation followed by the phase transition without any um, intermediate plastic deformation. And these uh, MD predictions have not been uh, confirmed experimentally yet, but have been definitely uh, supported by some uh, recent in situ x ray diffraction studies that have been able, because of like the time delay um, of the x ray um, uh, measurement, that have been able to uh, correlate the onset of the different waves, so these three waves, uh, with actually uh, the Elastic deformation follow uh, uh, just by the phase transition itself. So this was already um, suggesting that this deformation mechanism uh, is possible in silicon. Uh, and in order to provide further insights and being able to um, discern the different uh, deformation mechanism, what we've done is that we've performed in situ X-ray diffraction experiment at the LCLS X-ray free electron laser, and in particular, the modern extreme condition and station. And we have used single crystal samples uh, to be able to uh, uh, individuate not only the phase transitions, but also the orientation and the texture changes in the sample. And we uh, have used um, the highly monochromatic uh, X-ray probe, which ensures high fidelity when we uh, analyze the orientation and the evolution of single crystalline sample and use the long pulse laser at the MEC instrument to compress the sample. And uh, because of the high temporal resolution of the XFIL probe, we can then also follow in real time. So give a time resolved picture of the deformation of silicon under shock compression. And these are the experimental results we've obtained with this approach. Uh, I'm showing two uh, different uh, time series uh, obtained for different peak uh, compression pressure of 12.5 and 19.5 gigapascal. And so what you're seeing is from the bottom of the image to the top, the different uh, X-ray diffraction imaging, which have been projected along the diffraction and the azimuthal angle. And uh, on the side, we can also see the uh, integrated uh, 1D uh, diffraction pattern in like their whole extension and also with like zoom in panel to better uh, see the signal from the high pressure phases. So uh, I'm gonna start with like this lowest uh, pressure time series at 12.5 gigapascal. In this case, we have seen the appearance of uh, the signal of uh, high pressure phases. However, the signal is pretty noisy and quite low. So a precise deconvolution of the phases was not possible. We think because of the densities and because of the pressure that it is a mixture of the silicon 11 and silicon 5 phase 
And then from this pressure, because the samples that we were using were thinner, were 4.3, uh, sorry, 43 micrometer thick, uh, when we start probing later times, so around eight nanosecond time delay, we already start seeing a release uh, in the sample. And what's interesting is that upon release, we see very well crystallized uh, silicon too. So a lower pressure, high pressure phase that is observed during decompression, but is not um, detectable once after complete release. The personally, I think most interesting uh, time series is actually the one at higher pressure, also because the uh, it seems that we're crystallizing much more uh, of the high pressure phase because the signal is much more intense. So it's actually uh, giving us a way to perform a more detailed and quantitative analysis. And in this case, we do see uh, the crystallization of silicon five phase at 19.5 gigapascal. And as uh, we observe um, at different time delays, we see uh, that um, the silicon to uh, peaks grow. And after full release, what's really interesting is that in this case from higher pressure we do see still traces of the lower pressure phase so the silicon to down to zero gigapascal so it seems like the very uh, fast um, time scale of laser driven shock compression uh, can actually extend the metastability domain of this high pressure phase uh, which is really interesting because it's different from what happens for example under static compression for which silicon to during decompression normally back transforms to the ambient phase if at high temperature or transforms to different metastable phases such as the silicon three if at room temperature and another aspect that is very interesting of these results and that i'd like to stress is that um, we observe a very reproducible uh, texture uh, evolution for which the peaks of the high pressure phase seem to be uh, uh, growing um, in intensity, but also in like azimuthal extension. So it seems like texture um, is developing with time. And another, uh, the most interesting thing, I think it's that we did observe a very reproducible preferred orientation for which the 001 and 010 of uh, reflections of the silicon five high pressure phase were always at the same azimuthal angle as the 220 reflection of silicon one. So as I was saying, there is this uh, microstructure evolution that we have tried to quantify. So for doing that, uh, we have um, taken line outs of these X-ray diffraction peaks along the phi angle, and we've analyzed their time evolution. And we see that the full without maximum of the peaks along phi which can be uh, indicative of mosaicity, so of the different uh, orientation of crystallites present in the sample, or uh, can be indicative of the um, development of rotation and so defects in the sample, increases consistently with time. Uh, and this happens as the full width of maximum along theta, so along the scattering angle, decreases. So it seems that there is a correlation between the growth of the crystalline domain, which is uh, indicated by the decrease of this um, two theta full width on maximum with the increase of um, the disorder in the sample. And what's interesting to notice is that we do have at first uh, the phase transition, which appears to uh, happen with a very uh, strong preferential orientation, and then these uh, mosaicity start and disorder starts developing. And this uh, temporal trend actually seems to suggest that um, as predicted by MD simulation, the growth of the high pressure phase in silicon could happen inelastically, meaning that we first have the phase transition and then we start developing a plastic deformation at later times. So uh, in order to see whether this peculiar microstructural evolution could be due to the inelastic deformation in silicon, we have tried to um, link this preferential orientation with a specific orientation relationship between the different phases and so to a specific uh, transition mechanism. So I just want to stress once again that the inelastic uh, um, deformation in silicon 
implies that uh, the shear release, so the uh, equilibration between the pressure um, along and perpendicularly to the shock wave uh, propagation direction has to happen through the phase transition itself. And so when we think about the transition from the silicon one to the tetragonal silicon two phases, this can happen only for a very specific orientation uh, relationship, which is having the C axis of this uh, tetragonal phase being uh, parallel to the shockwave propagation. This is because this uh, C axis is the one along which uh, the interatomic distances are shorter in silicon two with respect to silicon one. But if we actually look at what happens perpendicularly, uh, so along the A and B, um, um, sorry, <laughs> crystal um, uh, basis vector of these silicon two phases, along these directions, the interatomic distances are actually higher for the high pressure phase. So what this means is that if we were to have a partial transformation, from the ambient to the high pressure phase, this would generate perpendicularly to the um, shockwave propagation, a compression st stress on the ambient phase because of this expansion of the high pressure phase perpendicularly uh, to the shock propagation. And uh, if we look at the orientation relationship, uh, the um, crystal uh, basis vector of silicon two to minimize the atomic displacement should be like um, rotated of 45 degree with respect to the cubic um, basis vector. And we have four uh, fully equivalent um, orientations because of the tetragonal symmetry of the silicon two phase. However, uh, this um, these, uh, equivalence of the uh, different orientation um, is lost as we keep progressing through the uh, sequence of high pressure phase transition, because when we go from the silicon to the silicon 11, we have a deformation from the tetragonal to an orthorhombic uh, structure. So this A equal B uh, symmetry is lost. And ultimately, when we get to the silicon five phase, which is the one that we have observed and we're interested in, um, this um, phase transformation sequence would result in two non-equivalent crystalline domain rotated of 90 degree with respect to each other that have this, uh, that would give this um, X-ray diffraction pattern for single crystals compressed in our experimental geometry. And I hope this is something vis somehow visible for you. I'm sorry, maybe the choice of scale and font size was not the best. But anyway, if we zoom in on what we were most interested in, we see that the simulated X-ray diffraction pattern in this geometry can explain really well our experimental observation. Because indeed, the presence of two domains of silicon five rotated of 90 degree with respect to each other can explain the presence at the same azimuthal angle of a 0, 1, 0 and a 0, 0, 1 reflection that otherwise would have to be like uh, perpendicular to each other in the reciprocal space. And it also shows that there, these reflections are expected to show at the same azimuthal angle as the two, two zero reflection of the ambient uh, silicon one, uh, one phase. So it, uh, it really shows that this specific deformation mechanism can explain our experimental data and the highly preferred orientation that we ob observed for the crystallization of the silicon five high pressure phase. Now, um, there are uh, previous studies that have also investigated uh, the deformation of silicon under shock compression. And in particular, it's very interesting uh, to compare with this uh, gas gun based study of single crystalline silicon 110 uh, compression performed by Turnor uh, and co-workers and published on PRL on 2016. Um, in this case, uh, the authors have uh, proposed a specific uh, orientation relationship that we have tested and cannot explain our data. So uh, it suggests that there uh, must be some differences between what's happening uh, in this experiment and in our experiment. Uh, another thing that uh, I wanted to stress is that uh, the author um, also suggested that there could be uh, 
more than one orientation uh, relationship present in um, this uh, data, which is in contrast with what we observed under laser driven shock compression. However, we cannot directly compare the experimental data because this uh, experiment has been performed in a slightly different geometry and uses a pink beam. So in order to really understand whether the differences between our observations and previous ones is due to the experimental setup or to, or to a substantially different uh, deformation mechanism, which could be because we are at different strain rates, uh, we have performed a forward XRD calculation using the uh, same experimental geometry and parameters as in this um, gas gun experiment. And we see that if we uh, hypothesize uh, an elastic uh, deformation for which the phase transition is the main uh, shear release mechanism, and then it's just uh, temporarily followed by the um, uh, development and generation and motion of defects, so of plasticity, uh, the strongly preferred orientation should be uh, visible also in these um, experimental configuration. However, if we perform the same calculations, um, hypothesizing a plastic deformation preceding the phase transition, this implies that the system would relax towards a hydrostatic uh, state before the phase transition. So this would actually relax the um, um, condition of uh, preferred uh, uniaxial growth of the high pressure phase. And this actually just um, means that in our simulation, we've uh, allowed and included the reflection from all the different uh, possible equivalent uh, orientation between uh, the uh, silicon one and silicon two. And in this case, we do observe the presence of uh, multiple orientations and uh, data that can be uh, much more uh, similar to those observed by Tournor. So it really seems that the presence of multiple orientation relationship can be directly linked with the um, plastic deformation regimes under uh, gas gun shock compression, whilst when we perform an uh, experiment at a faster time scale, such in like laser driven shock compression, we do see the signature of the inelastic uh, deformation. So just to quickly summarize, uh, using ultra fast X-ray diffraction uh, with laser driven shock compression of single crystalline silicon, we have been able to observe and quantitatively study the orientation and the microstructure evolution of uh, our sample and link this with a very specific deformation mechanism. And so we're able to provide an atomic, atomistic view of silicon deformation mechanism at this uh, nanosecond time scale. And because of uh, the, the strongly preferred orientation, we have been able to link this with the specific inelastic shear release mechanism that seems to be peculiar only to the ultra fast uh, time scale of laser driven shock compression as opposed to what happens at lower strain rates for uh, gas gun uh, based uh, shock compression. And, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to mention that we think that this um, view of a strain rate dependent deformation mechanism can actually uh, explain and help explaining some of the controversies that were still um, present around the deformation of uh, silicon under shock compression. And of course, uh, I want to acknowledge all of our um, collaborators, um, both at Slack. Uh, so the, also the team from MEC, uh, my supervisor, Ariana Gleza, all the other people that have contributed to this study. And of course, I wanted to thank you again for being here today, for tuning in and for being so patient. And I'm happy to take questions if there is any time left. Well, thank you very much, Sylvia. Yeah, there's a little time. Um, there is a question, one question in the chat box. Why don't you go for that? and? If there are any questions from the floor, uh, please feel free to cut in and, and ask them. Okay, I might have to stop sharing. Oh, no, wait, I found. The, um, Is it in the chat? The bottom somewhere. Um, it's in the Q&A. Sorry. Uh, 
Okay. I, I can. Sorry, sorry. I think I found it. Sorry, it took me a moment. <laughs> I, uh, is this? I believe that previous work has used perpendicular shock drive and X-ray probe to observe phase transition without time blurring. Was that an issue here? And do you know how your result compare? Um, oh yeah. Oh um, yes. Um, I think uh, we are talking. Sorry. Let me just quickly. Uh, oh. Technology is not my friend. Okay, I think we're talking about this study here in which um, Emma McBride and her team, it's true, yeah, they, they did perf uh, perform um, um, diffraction perpendicularly uh, to the drive um, propagation. And yeah, they, they, they did say that in this way, they could really distinguish between the different um, portions of the sample. So they were really uh, selective on probing only the, um, the uh, compressed portion of the sample. Uh, however, because we're using a single crystal lane sample, we don't really have this problem, even if we are in a collinear geometry, because uh, when we start with such uh, perfect single crystals and we have this highly monochromatic X-ray uh, probe, uh, what happens is that we don't see the diffraction signal from the starting material. So we're actually able to see the signal only once there is some um, defects, some texture, some mosaicity to it. I'm sorry, I hope you don't hear the noises in the street. It's very noisy here. Um, so this actually ensures us that as soon as we do see some signal, this signal is only from uh, the compressed region. So this is our way to clearly distinguish whether we're, so we don't even need to go in the um, perpendicular uh, geometry because we know that our signal only comes from regions that have already undergone shock compression. I hope this answered the question and I hope that was the question and the study you were referring to. Ivan has another question in the chat box. Okay. I am confused of your notions of inelastic and plastic deformation. I thought inelastic deformation is more general than plasticity, the latter being uh, a mechanism operational in metals, generation and motion of dislocation, et cetera. Can you please clarify the difference in your definition of inelastic and plastic deformation? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, it, it was <laughs> something that we debated on quite for quite some time. Um, inelastic, and I, I just want to say it's not a name that I have given, it's mostly the name that has been given when the uh, group, uh, well, in the Mogni uh, 2014 paper, they found this very peculiar uh, shear release uh, mechanism um, uh, predicted in shock compressed silicon, maybe it's, um, so the difference between inelastic and plastic is that um, what was termed inelastic deformation is a deformation mechanism for which we first have a first state of uniaxial elastic compression. And we know that in this case, it's only one of the axes that is being compressed and the other are kind of like unperturbed. So we do have shear stress because of the unbalance between the um, direction that is being compressed and the directions uh, perpendicular, the plane perpendicular to the shock propagation. And so we know that from this state, uh, we can, uh, the system after a certain threshold, we start relaxing to our anhydrostatic uh, state of compression. And uh, this means that basically the shear release, uh, the shear stress is released. And so the pressure along the different directions starts being equal. And this can happen through the development of defects. And as you were uh, mentioning in the chat, this is the classic deformation uh, mechanism that we think also for metals, and it's like this plastic deformation. In our case, what we've seen per silicon is that we don't have an intermediate defect um, driven deformation between the el purely elastic uh, compression and the phase transition, which means that actually the pressure imbalance is compensated through the phase transition itself. What I mean is that because of the um, fact that we can 
kind of like see the silicon to a unit cell as like a cubic one squeezed along one direction. So what happens is that we do have one direction, the C axis along which the uh, atoms are closer to each other, but they're actually, um, uh, the interatomic distances are actually higher uh, if we look at this uh, along the A and B axis of the silicon two phase. So basically what happens is that uh, is the phase transition itself. So the transformation towards this high pressure phase that has an expanded lattice perpendicularly to the shock that, ex um, that generates the pressure on the silicon one. So we actually have an effect of a sort of like, I would, I would normally call it a sort of like phase transition pressure that uh, basically uh, gives us a re the shear release. So in this sense, it's inelastic, meaning that it doesn't involve the generation of defect, but it's only uh, caused by the phase transition itself. And so it's actually the geometry of the phase transition that dictates the equilibration and so the relaxation towards an hydrostatic um, state. And this, we think it's pretty, uh, nicely uh, visible in our data because we do see that the nucleation of the high pressure phase happens with very strong preferred orientation. And then the texture is actually something, the development of textures of mosaicity and defects is something that happens in a second moment. So it really seems that the uh, moment at which the um, system relaxes from the uniaxial compression corresponds to the phase transition rather than a classic uh, plastic deformation. I'm sorry, I hope this was clear. I notice I'm going back and forth between slides. Let me know if this answered your question.